from the studios of Postscript Media and Canary Media. The 2022 Winter Olympic Games kicked off in China over the weekend, and it was a rough start for many alpine skiers. It's key for Michaela to get a good rhythm right out of the start gate here. That's when you can really see if she's attacking normally right out of the first couple of gates. One quarter of skiers couldn't finish the women's giant slalom, including defending American gold medalist Michaela Schifrin. Yeah, when she can see, oh, she's already having trouble. Whoa, oh, yeah, down she goes. Same problem as Bacino. Unbelievable Schifrin, who is one of the most consistent and mistake-free skiers that we've ever seen goes down on her hip and out in her first run here in Beijing. Days before that disqualifying fall, Schifrin raised concern about the conditions. High winds, a very steep grade, and for the first time ever, 100% artificial snow. When the cameras are zoomed in on the skiers, it looks like there's a lot of snow, but pull back and the mountains in the region around Beijing are barren. The ski courses are just strips of white against brown. And that's because the location of this year's Winter Games is more akin to a desert than a winter wonderland. The rainfall in Beijing and Hebei, the province which is jointly hosting the Games, it's about a fifth of the nation's overall rainfall. And it's extremely dry during the winter months. Artificial snow, snow made by machines, is becoming more common at the Olympics as the planet warms. But it can bother athletes. The snow can be harder, icier, less forgiving, and environmental experts are bothered for other reasons. Hundreds of snow machines have been at work creating slopes over the past few months. It's a process that requires huge amounts of water and energy, which is environmentally damaging. It's prompted one scientist to call Beijing, quote, the least sustainable games of all time. In order to meet just basic demand, you need to have a huge network of pipes, uh, including this massive diversion project that's bringing water in from um, wetter provinces. It's really questionable whether this is sustainable. Nearly 50 million gallons of water are being piped in to serve the Beijing Games, possibly setting reserves in this water-stressed region back by hundreds of years. This year's Olympics were supposed to be China's chance to brand itself as an environmental champion on the world stage. But not everyone is buying it. There's a lot of skepticism internationally and groups that are observing China from afar, um, you know, whether it's geologists looking at water use or it's environmental activists who are considering the carbon footprint, a lot of them just think this can't quite be as good as it all sounds. This is The Carbon Copy. I'm Stephen Lacey. This week, sustainability is a top priority for organizers of the Olympics. China says this year's event is the most environmentally sound winter games ever. But there's no system to track those claims, and some researchers say the games are actually getting worse for the environment. America's Green Banks are preparing to unleash a wave of capital for clean energy. The Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund invests a historic $27 billion in projects nationwide. This could mobilize up to $150 billion of private capital for solar, storage, efficiency, and electrification in underserved communities. So how do we deploy those billions quickly, efficiently, and with the highest impact? On July 18th, Latitude Media and Banyan Infrastructure will host a virtual event exploring the -the on-the-ground realities of making America's green banks a success. Register for free by clicking the link in the show notes or go to latitudemedia.com slash events. Clean energy and climate tech are policy-driven industries, and anyone working in this field touches local, state, and federal policy in a very real way. And that's why you should be listening to Political Climate, a podcast from Latitude Media and Boundary Stone Partners that delivers an insider's view on climate policy and politics. Every other week, co-hosts Julia Piper, Emily Dominich, and Brandon Hurlbuck cover the nuances of government funding, regulations, backroom negotiations, and the election, of course. Political Climate is a show for people who want authentic conversations and strong opinions from voices across the political spectrum. Listen at latitudemedia.com or subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts. So I am Christian Shepard, and I'm a China correspondent for The Washington Post. Christian is normally based in Taipei. He writes about culture, politics, and human rights. But at this particular moment, I've just arrived to cover the Winter Olympics in Beijing. So where does sustainability 
climate change fit into the types of stories that you are currently reporting on now as you're watching what's happening at the Olympics? It's a big part of our focus uh, around the games, but also for China in general. Environmental issues and climate change have gone from being something of a, a fairly fringe aspect of coverage to being a really central piece of so much of what we do. And in part, that's been reflected in, in how it's moved up the, the political agenda here in China. The Olympics are a bubble. They're like cities made from scratch to serve a single purpose, sports. Christian says being a reporter at this year's Beijing Games is even more bubble-like. COVID controls make every movement heavily restricted. And all the green measures feel disconnected from the way China actually runs its coal-based economy. In a way, we've got like a different kind of bubble being created. Um, so you have the coronavirus bubble and then you have this, this green bubble. What specifically is, is China talking about when it comes to the sustainability of the games? China says these will be the first ever carbon neutral games, uh, winter games. So Tokyo, I believe, was the first ever carbon neutral summer games. At least that was the intention. China wants these to be the first ever carbon neutral winter games. China's been playing this up for months. Before the game started, they released this big sustainability report outlining all the steps they're taking. And then they held a press conference with a large group of senior officials. They wanted to tell international reporters, we are doing as much as we can. What would a green winter games look like? As something we are all eager to see. Today we and so there's a whole host of different um, efforts that are being made to try and bring that about in terms of electricity, it's all buying from renewables using this green exchange that Beijing has set up. The past six years, we have been implementing the vision of sustainability and the green games as we make the preparations, which have been closely integrated into the development of the city and the region and contributed to a better economic environment. They reused some of the venues from the Summer Olympics to try and reduce the, the footprint from construction. The transport, the buses that we get moved around in, a lot of those are, are hydrogen. Again, these are things that are very much kind of the cutting edge of what China is trying to do for its overall economy. But the rest of the city around it and the rest of the country is a very different story. I have in front of me this pre-game sustainability report outlining all the different measures that China is taking. And there's this page here with all these fancy icons that, that outlines many of the measures that you referenced. Um, they're talking about building the greenest ice, making the games carbon neutral, which is a very squishy term, promoting wildlife conservation and competition zones. There's a long list here. Who's actually tracking whether these things are being implemented and making an impact? Well, the short answer is China and not really anyone else. Um, and this is one of the big problems that people who are looking at overall Olympic sustainability they raise that the IOC doesn't have the tools in place to check up on whether or not the uh, Olympics hosts are meeting their commitments. There uh, haven't really been independent checks carried out in a sort of consistent way. Um, some countries have done, you know, got other groups in to make sure that what they're saying is accurate, but um, more closed off countries uh, haven't been willing to uh, let that level of scrutiny happen. So places like China, really the IOC is just taking the host country at their word. And this is one of the, the big problems that you have around the idea of sustainability in the Olympics. So the people who are in favor of this idea that the Olympics can promote sustainability, they say, well, look at it as a kind of a showcase. It's, it's an exemplar of the best a country can do. And after that, it will help to promote this broader shift. But people on the other side say, look, it's still a mass sporting event. You still have to do a lot of construction. There's going to be a huge carbon footprint. And more often than not, it's a, a way to kind of spread the idea of being sustainable without actually making it happen in the long run. So it's, you know, the usual concerns around greenwashing. And uh, without any independent checks, we can't really say for sure, you know, which of those two sides has it right. If this is so core to the way the games are sold, and there is all this pressure, national pressure and pressure on the IOC, why don't we have more movement on a coherent standard 
for measuring what sustainability is. As you talk to folks, what is your sense for why that is not coming together? A lot of it is issues with the broader Olympic movement. You know, you have this situation where a lot of developed liberal democratic countries, they are less and less keen to host the games. And I think in particular the Winter Games when it's already known that um, there are potentially significant impacts to uh, alpine regions, uh, water stress. So uh, when it came to these uh, Winter Olympics, the, the last two countries running were uh, Kazakhstan and uh, China. Oslo pulled out a number of countries at the last minute and decided, we don't want to do this, we don't have public support. And so the IOC has a, a bit of a, a difficult balancing act that if they start pressuring countries to really hold true to their promises, then they might turn off the already dwindling number of host countries that are willing to put on these events. It's very difficult for the IOC to bring independent verification at a time when what they need is to stay on the good side of host countries. So what would an independent check actually reveal? After the break, researchers quantify the environmental impact of the Olympics, and the trend isn't going in the right direction. On July 18th, join Latitude Media and Banyan Infrastructure as we take a deep dive into the next phase of deploying the $27 billion Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. We'll provide practical insights for the state agencies and local lenders at the front lines of dispensing these funds. Where are the bottlenecks? How do we balance speed with transparency? And can America's green banks live up to the expectations of both local communities and Wall Street? Latitude Media's Stephen Lacey, Banyan co-founder Amanda Lee, and Clean Energy Fund of Texas EVP Billy Briscoe will answer these questions and more on July 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern. This is a must-attend for project developers and financiers. Register for free at latitudemedia.com slash events or click the link in the show notes. I'm Julia Piper. I'm Brandon Hurlbut. And I'm Emily Dominich. A little over a year ago, political climate took a break so we could focus on the groundwork of implementing America's biggest ever climate bill, the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm excited to say political climate is back. And I'll be joined by my two co-hosts to riff on the top political stories and insider scoops from state houses to the halls of Congress to regulatory agencies and even international climate talks. We'll explain how those developments are driving industry decisions today. Political Climate is a show for people who want authentic conversations. And to learn about how energy and climate policy is shaped within both political parties from the people who have actually helped shape it. So join me, Brandon and Emily, every other week, starting in April, for fresh episodes of Political Climate. Subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Thirty years ago, Olympics organizers started talking about the environment. And then, more recently, they started talking about climate change. Well, in the 90s, uh, the Olympic movement made sustainability one of its core pillars. And since then, every host country has emphasized that it's doing a lot to try and be sustainable. And what has happened, though, is that there's been this increase in rhetoric that hasn't really cashed out. Last year, a group of researchers took a look at the claims of events organizers. If everyone's talking about sustainability, are the games getting more sustainable? So they evaluated the summer and winter games between 1992 and 2020. They looked at the environmental footprint of construction, the displacement of people, and the way infrastructure was reused after the games. What they found was surprising. The 2002 Salt Lake City Games earned the best score. Sochi in 2014 and Rio de Janeiro in 2016 were the two least sustainable. Overall, sustainability across a few metrics has declined over time. Those researchers, they're uh, essentially having to do ad hoc measurements and are doing their best to try and create a framework that could be applied across different events. And they're very open about that in their process. Um, what they're trying to do is to start the conversation about ways we can measure this, trying to find some solid indicators, and then to compare those across time. But the problem is that that's not happening at the moment. So all they can do is to go in and to look at what the host country says, look at whatever independent verification there might be, consider media reports, um, anything else they can find, and to try and create a standard uh, way of measuring out of that. But right now, that doesn't exist. 
the Olympics are the equivalent of building a city very quickly. This is a, a mega event that is extremely difficult to pull off, uh, has long-term you know, planning and economic consequences. Can you speak to this complexity of the infrastructure around you and what it tells you about why an Olympics with minimal impact is so elusive? Sure. So even though I just arrived, uh, I was in Beijing up until uh, September last year. So uh, I saw most of the construction take place. And yes, this year they reused a lot, but still it was a huge, huge undertaking. Venues, they spread from the sort of far southwest of the city up to a neighboring city, which had to have a new high-speed rail uh, line put in in order to make it the journey quick enough so that people could move back and forth between the different venues. The ski resorts that have been built, uh, you know, you have to occasionally kind of take chunks out of the mountain to have enough space to build the hotels and make sure that, you know, they're going to be economically viable. It ends up sort of remaking huge parts of the, of the city. And yes, you can, you can say, well, that's going to be sustainable growth, right? That's the idea that the Olympics and, and China is, is pushing. But, you know, I've been to areas nearby the uh, ski resorts. And as soon as you get outside the bounds of the, the kind of area that is determined for the games, life hasn't really changed much. Uh, you know, there are these villages nearby there that, that were still burning, uh, you know, dried cow dung as, as a way of heating their houses. So, you know, the idea that this is, is, is creating a sort of a brand new sustainable economic model, it doesn't really make sense. And it's why I keep going back to this idea of a bubble. Um, you know, you rebuild uh, for one area, you bring in perhaps new ways of powering things sustainably for one particular project. But the rest of the economy around you is still the same old economy. And as I'm hearing you describe that, in many ways, that's reflective of the development of China's clean energy economy. Over the years, we've seen massive renewable energy projects that were built and not connected to the grid for a long time. We saw large, sustainable buildings and supposedly eco-friendly cities that were sitting empty. And uh, much of this development happened in a bubble and not was not reflective of the broader economy. Absolutely. I mean, China's uh, energy grid has been built dependent on coal. It, it's, it's an addiction for the country, really, because the concern when China was still a, a you know, a, a fairly underdeveloped country was that they weren't going to have enough energy. And what's the one resource we have? Well, we got a lot of coal. Let's dig that up and make sure that we can use that to power this growth that we need to become a strong nation. And so there is a whole institution, both politically and you know, technically, that has been built around using coal as much as possible. And to get away from that and to start relying on renewable energies it doesn't just take uh, you know, a technical fix. It's sort of a, a bureaucratic issue. You've got to rework departments. There are regions of the country that have been relying on this for growth. I mean, huge regions. We're not talking like a couple of coal-fired power plants. Uh, yeah, this is hundreds and hundreds. It's made it very difficult to make that shift. And we started to see that last year when there were uh, power shortages. So uh, China's recovery from the pandemic has been fairly rapid, particularly in, in industry. Uh, so that means that a lot, of, a lot of electricity was being used, particularly as you're getting into winter. And um, coal prices were down. And so coal-fired power plants, they weren't willing to run because they were going to be making losses. And there wasn't enough renewables ready and available to make up that shortfall. And so you started seeing power rationing across the countries and even some, uh, some blackouts in certain areas for short periods. Uh, and that really highlighted the issue that you have now is that they're trying to make this, this sharp turn, but at the same time, you can't do it without kind of not only making all these technical fixes to the grid and building all these uh, turbines, you also need to have the kind of institutional uh, knowledge of how to deal with a more flexible power source um, so there, there's still a huge way to go. Christian Shepard is a China correspondent for The Washington Post.
Well, I hope you get to enjoy the sporting events without having to calculate the carbon intensity of the fake snow or all the things around you. I'll certainly try. <laughs> the Carbon Copy is a co-production of Postscript Media and Canary Media. Our producers are Jamie Kaiser, Dalvin Abouage, Daniel Waldorf, Alexandria Herr, and Anne Bailey is our editor. Sean Marquand mixed the episode and composed our theme. Original music came from Blue Dot Sessions and Echo Finch. Thanks to Canary Media for being our distribution partner. Find all our back episodes at canarymedia.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also find Catalyst with Shail Khan. That's our companion podcast. That is a deep dive conversations on how to decarbonize the global economy, where the money is going, what new and emerging techs are helping us solve these problems. Super cool show. You can get it at canarymedia.com or any podcast app. And uh, spread the word about our show. Thank you to all the new listeners who've joined. We've seen strong growth here, but you can help by giving us a rating and review or passing a link to your friends and colleagues. And of course, join us here next week. I'm Stephen Lacey. This is The Carbon Copy. Carbon Copy.